I'm here with Richard Tarnas at Norwac in 2011. Richard is the author of the uh, groundbreaking and um, amazing Cosmos and Psyche. Um, so Richard, welcome to Norwac. Glad to have you here. Thank um, you. When I read Cosmos and Psyche, I, my impression was that this was going to be a, this book was going to have a really profound effect on our culture and on the world, and and I, I think that other people did, although I haven't really been tracking that. But you're in the university yourself, and I'm wondering if you've been able to track its effect, at least in that realm, in that arena. Well, it represents such a paradigm shift for the mainstream academic world. I, I certainly didn't expect to take the, that world by storm with, with a single book of evidence that basically, uh, you know, when you, when you see that astrology, or when, when we recognize that astrology is essentially the the gold standard of superstition in our culture. Uh, there's no way that a single work with uh, even as much evidence carefully presented as is in Cosmos and Psyche, that's not going to turn the, uh, the ship around. But um, probably not a day goes by when I don't get um, you know, a, you know, letters, emails, uh, and, and feedback from readers, many of whom are in, you know, different um, parts of higher education uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, professors, but uh, very often, uh, more often, say, graduate students and, and uh, so forth. So my sense is that that book, I wrote it for the long term, it, and I see it as having a potential effect over, over uh, in future years, and you know, it's 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 had some influence now, but it's up against uh, such a, you know, we've had several hundred years in which the idea that there could be any meaningful correspondence between the patterns of the planets in the heavens and the patterns of human experience, that idea is so off the radar screen uh, and, and really. Completely counterintuitive to what the um, mainstream academic world would assume to be true, that this hasn't a book like this isn't going to make much of a dent to begin with. Now, my first book, *The Passion of the Western Mind*, is used in um, hundreds of universities uh, in the United States, but also in other countries. Um, I, I stopped counting after a hundred, so I don't really know how many it's being used in, but in philosophy departments or history of Western civilization courses or seminaries and so forth. And that, that's a history of Western thought that I deliberately, while astrology plays a role in it in terms of being part of that history, I, it is not a, an astrological work and I don't um, uh, interweave what's going on in the sky, with the, what planetary alignments are coinciding with Descartes' uh, philosophical um, breakthrough or, or Galileo turning his telescope to the heavens. But then I do all that in the next book, Cosmos and Psyche. So I use the first book, uh, Passion of the Western Mind, as a kind of Trojan horse that established some credibility in the academic world so that people who like that book or use it, et cetera, are more likely to then take seriously this, you know, more uh, revolutionary idea that astrology has validity. And then they could go on to read Cosmos and Psyche. Great. Well, thanks for the contribution, for sure. You know, in the, in the book, you, um, you look at squares and, and you look at the, whole, at the whole cycle, you know, from square to opposition to closing square. Um, Start, so starting always at the con I mean, yeah, conjunctions and oppositions, I, I put the major focus on. Right, and, and I was wondering if you noticed uh, anything in your research, a difference between the opening square and the closing square? Um, you know, this is, a, uh, this is an issue that Dane Rudyar particularly uh, developed in a, a sense for the unfolding cycle and the differing um, roles that the two squares play. And uh, Rob Hand did uh, kind of translated that into a systematic transit cookbook, the book Planets in Transit. 
um, in practice, when I uh, when I look at the, I mean, well, there is there is a definite difference between the squares and compared with the uh, conjunctions and oppositions of these big. We're talking, by the way, about uh, if you're talking about cosmos and psyche, we're talking about the big historical cycles, the world transits where everybody is is involved, not just personal transits. And if we look at, for example, um, the difference between a Uranus-Pluto conjunction, say, of the 1960 to 72 period with the typical Uranus-Pluto combination of this mass empowerment of Promethean energies and liberating revolutionary <coughs> phenomena, and turmoil, etc. So that's a conjunction. Then you look at an opposition, such as happened during the French of the same planets, French Revolutionary Epoch, 1787 to 1798. You have the exact same phenomena, the exact same quality of, uh, you know, mass empowerment of the Promethean impulse, uh, and at the same time, one is a conjunction, the other is opposition, and it's not really. There's much more that's similar about those two periods having the same archetypal dynamic uh, informing each of them, uh, there's much more similar than there is different. And the squares, the squares seem to have a little bit, they tend to have a, a smaller orb compared with the conjunctions and the oppositions. The squares tend to have um, a little more uh, instability to them and a tendency to, they're a little, I think, harder to um, assimilate. This is also true for personal transits and so forth. And they, but at the same time, they can be unusually dynamic. There's something especially uh, likely to bring about a concrete event out of out of a square. Now, the question about opening and closing squares. Um, it, I. Do not personally, on the, on, on the basis of the historical research, have a, a de decisive sense of the difference, even though I, my sense is that Rudyard's right. I mean, I see them as being much more similar than different. My sense is that Rudyard's right, that the closing square is just going to have more of a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's on its way to the end of the cycle, while the opening square is, is the first, um, pancake, so to speak, after the initial batter was made in the, to use a very homely example, uh, during the conjunction. And uh, there's something to be, I, I theoretically think that there, that that is the case, that there is a difference between them. But historically, what I mainly notice is, at the level of analysis I've done in research, is that you see this, this the same archetypal energies, that complex of energies, tends to express itself with um, a kind of very, a very visible, uh, very visibly in concrete events under each of the quadrature aspects, the conjunction, the square, the opposition, and then the, the closing square. Each of them, and there, and um, while there is a continuing relationship between what happens under each of those uh, alignments and what happened during the preceding one, um, I don't, at this point, I can't point to, well, this is definitely a, an example of a closing square compared with an opening square. I think that research will be done and people are going to be able to see it, but at this, at the level that I've done, I'm more tracking the, um, this more macro uh, similarity uh, of the same archetypal themes coming up under each of those big alignments. Do you see history as a story that you could describe as progressively forward moving? It certainly has uh, a progressive aspect and there's no question in my mind that, for example, we see a moral evolution from, let's say, from the point of view of, let's say, racism or uh, patriarchal uh, sexism, say as recently as say the 1950s uh, and early 60s, compared with now in the United States, a real a moral evolution has happened. Also in relationship to uh, 
um, uh, gay rights, for example, has been a, been a you know clear deepening of the moral uh, consciousness in these fundamental areas of life, and and even like on a broader scale, you could say, a broader historical scale, there's no question that like mass entertainment for the late Roman Empire was watching, um, you know, murderous, uh, uh, torturous uh, um, circuses taking place in the in the vast amphitheater uh, 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 locations during the, the holidays of the Roman Empire, of which there are many, and they were watching absolutely horrific things, um, which we don't have to spell out here, and that was that was. Daily, and people would come, bring their families, they'd be eating, etc. Now people go to football games, and um, that's a development. I mean, the football games can be brutal, but they're not being, the gladiators aren't being torn limb from limb, uh, the Christians aren't being uh, eat, eaten up by lions, and, and so for the entertainment of the population. Um, there's been a really deep um, moral evolution. That being said, there's lots of uh, regressions and and losses that take place in the course of history. There, I mean, clearly, uh, other peoples, other cultures, other eras had a larger, um, say, eco-spiritual sensitivity. Let's say than the than the typical modern um, industrial. Um, mode of consciousness that would go in and see what would have been a sacred mountain in one era and society turned into just a, uh, a, a mining project or uh, a, a sacred forest turned into you know clear-cutting ancient redwoods and so forth. Um, there's been real losses and, and earlier eras had more profound spiritual um, more profound spiritual, let's say, access to the spiritual world, uh, while the the later Western and modern self has tended to be much more developed in its thinking function, but has lost that kind of what Rudolf Steiner would call that kind of uh, pr primal clairvoyance, uh, that that spiritual. Discernment of the of the um, or that discernment of the spiritual realm that was more accessible in earlier eras, and a person like Plato or Plotinus uh, was able to describe metaphysical experiences that uh, are that the typical that the philosopher in the typical academic setting today um, it has lost touch with, so. Sometimes there is a, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that there are losses and gains in, in every uh, epoch and that can be spiritual, it can be ecological, uh, uh, you know, it would be, as I say, there's been great social advances, moral advances, and there's also uh, been I mean, it's been since the 60s that much of the worst uh, corporate, industrial, technological uh, devastation of the earth has taken place at the same time that this marvelous advance has been made in um, the rights of uh, women, of uh, minorities, and so forth. Where do you see astrologies? Rightful place in in culture, you know. It's it, currently it's uh it's on the fringe. But you know, if we listen to how people speak about astrology, you know, people who haven't experienced astrology might say, "Do you believe in astrology?" And other folks may ask, "How do you prove astrology?" And so the question arises: Is it a science? Is it an art? Is it religion? I mean, where do you see its proper proper place in our culture? Well. Um, I can easily imagine that a culture that more or less became as as enlightened as, say, large numbers of people are who uh, 
well, live in the Bay Area or come to um, astrological or <clears throat> international transpersonal conferences and, and, and so forth, uh, Jungian uh, institutes and things like that. If, if, if our civilization were to move, tr be transformed to the point where those sensibilities and those communities of learning were more uh, central to the, to the culture, uh, there's no, no question that we would have a more self-aware and cosmically grounded and spiritually oriented um, civilization. And I, those would all be great pluses. Uh, on the other hand, I have to hasten to mention that astrology, as it, as it is still currently practiced, has all sorts of um, deficiencies and shadow uh, consequences. Many astrologers do kind of, um, concretely predictive, deterministic kinds of statements and, and interpretations that can be wounding for the uh, client to hear. There, there is often um, a, a lot of mm, kind of rules of interpretation that are have been handed down uh, in a in an unthinking and unexamined way that are uh, suggest that they may be kind of ad hoc rules that are not really grounded in careful uh, examination of of the evidence. So there are major areas of improvement that are waiting to happen within the astrological community that, uh, and bridges also need to, to be built between the astrological community and the non-astrological uh, intelligent public that um, will require not just the education of that public but it will also require a greater um, skill and self-awareness and care and rigor on the part of the astrological community. So in a sense, I think astrology is still in almost like an adolescent phase, at least in, at this time in its, uh, uh, of history. It's in that, that phase, not perhaps quite ready for, at least as, as an overall phenomenon. I mean, there are individual astrologers uh, who are doing work of such high quality and are so able to articulate things in a way that's accessible to the uh, educated non-astrological public that they're ready to go. But uh, the astrological community generally is still, I think, working within constraints that deter it from being embraced by the mainstream culture. So I want to, on the one hand, affirm an eventual rightful place of astrology properly evolved to be uh, playing a central role in cultural life and intellectual life. I mean, it's one of the most powerful tools we have for understanding history, for understanding the human psyche. As Stan Groff says, it's a Rosetta Stone of the human psyche. It's a um, it's extraordinarily uh, useful in understanding works of art, films, looking at the actors' charts, at the directors, uh, at the uh, where the planets are at the time that the film comes out and audiences are viewing it and so forth. I, ca I can't think of any other uh, frame of reference that can be as satisfyingly illuminating of of, of culture, psychology, history, and, and, and philosophy, and so forth, as astrology can be. It can seem ridiculous that given something that's that illuminating, that powerful an intellectual tool, that it would be so scorned. On the other hand, there's very good historical reasons for why it, it has been marginalized and uh, having to do with the natural evolution of the uh, the, in the course of the modern uh, the enlightenment and the the autonomous modern self, it in some sense had to 
negate astrology in order to have a more robust sense of its autonomy. Uh, and that was part of the whole objectifying of the universe that took place with uh, the scientific revolution. But, uh, and there's also very good reasons why astrology hasn't been quite ready for prime time to come back into the center of culture. But I think it will happen and should happen uh, eventually, but not, not any time in the next uh, uh, you know, couple of weeks or anything. Right. Well, you know, what, one thing I think about that, that type of, of analysis where you're looking back at, at a cultural event that unfolds or, or for instance, tracking uh, changes in music um, over time, is it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a really powerful tool to use astrology. And yet, I, I also wonder what it's, what it's for when you do that. It makes me think of literary criticism, right? So some, some folks um, criticize literary criticism. I've always loved literary criticism. I think it's really beautiful to look back at someone's work and, and analyze it. And a lot of times, you know, the, the criticism itself is, becomes a work of art. Um, and yet you could, you could also say, well, but what's, what's that for, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if there's an answer to that, or what, but I wonder what you, think, what you think about that. Well, let's leave aside the literary criticism thing because it, that would be a whole, another, whole other issue. <laughs> and and there's, there's, uh, there's profound literary criticism, and then there's uh, kind of um, uh, literary criticism that does nothing but... Um, uh, deconstruct and even destroy the appreciation of a given work uh, of art, of, of a great work of art even. Um, so, but in terms of what, say, our archetypal astrological understanding of the patterns of history can provide as, um, you know, for example, had the world been better aware of the shadow potential of the Saturn opposite Pluto, uh, during the 2001 to 2004 period um, with that tendency for uh, to draw boundaries that are very rigid between uh, a good and evil, like to see evil out there and good here and on, on, on your side and then to then, you know, the, the tendency towards uh, war, towards preemptive, destructive um, uh, operations and that the the misguided reaction by the Bush admin, Cheney administration after 9/11, for example, both 9/11 and the Iraq War and Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo and so forth are all reflective of that Saturn-Pluto opposition. And had there been more knowledge of the Saturn-Pluto uh, uh, archetypal complex, how it's come through in history before, there would have been a greater awareness of the way in which a, the collective psyche could get possessed by a shadow expression of that energy and get into this kind of rigid othering and um, uh, scapegoating and um, uh, objectifying and splitting that even the use of terror in the supposed higher cause of fighting terror all those things are such typical characteristics of the shadow side of the Saturn Pluto complex if there'd been more self-awareness it would have been had very practical consequences and that's true also in our individual lives to know uh, better what what forces might be at work at a certain time so that we can act with greater um, consciousness, greater autonomy. Right, so it becomes about choices that you can make in the moment because you're, you have that knowledge. Yes. And it's also just aesthetically interesting and historically interesting to understand, like, well, why didn't the French Revolution happen five years earlier, you know? Um, all, the, uh, all the conditions were there, let's say, you know, uh, or why is there so many revolutions happening at once, uh, like uh, in 1848 or the, the Arab Spring uh, in 2011? With you know, the, once you start seeing the, the you know what else is happening, the Uranus Pluto um, alignment or the Jupiter Uranus conjunction that combined with that during the the uh, first months of 
2011. Those are, uh, it, it provides a real explanatory frame of reference for understanding otherwise inexplicable historical convergences of, of uh, synchronistic phenomena. And I'm thinking also that, if, if nothing else, it also provides a, a sense of meaning and a connection with meaning and with that idea that you bring up in your book that the primal world is ensouled and, and that alone is worth a lot, I think. Ab absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, there's something healing uh, to recognize that we are embedded in a larger uh, ensouled cosmos, that, that there are deeper purposes and meanings unfolding through human history than just um, uh, human constructs and selfish ambitions and so forth. There's, there's, uh, one gets a sense of that we're participating in something much more magnificent.